as we've been talking about uh, all morning, Thursday will mark one year since the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Pro-Trump protesters on that day stormed the Capitol building, leaving more than 150 law enforcement officers injured in that attack. Then President Donald Trump was accused of inciting an insurrection and was impeached, impeached for a second time in the aftermath. The impeachment vote that followed was the most bipartisan in modern times. 57 senators in all voted to convict Mr. Trump in the impeachment trial in the Senate, 50 Democrats and seven Republicans. But that total, of course, did fall short of the 67 needed for a conviction. Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin was the lead impeachment manager. He writes about the experience, which came at an incredibly difficult time in a very personal new book. It's called Unthinkable, Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy. And Congressman Raskin joins us now. Congressman, thank you for being here. When we say a difficult time in your family's life, we're talking about the, the twin tragedy, not the political tragedy, but the personal tragedy. Your 25-year-old son, Tommy, who you call pure love, pure magic in this book, lost a battle with depression on New Year's Eve last. You found him. It's one year later. How's your family doing? Um, well, it was a continuing struggle to reconcile ourselves to the new reality, but we're able to talk about Tommy without drowning in grief and agony. Before, it was very difficult even to talk about him, and so now we can talk about him, and I hope that my book uh, celebrates him and his life, which, which was extraordinary, although obviously way, way too short. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. Go yeah, ahead, go Gail. Ahead. No, I know. We no. both want this question because we think it's so Yeah, important. we were both talking about it uh, during the break. Number one, I love the title of the book, Unthinkable, because it is what it is on many different levels. Unthinkable about his death, unthinkable about what happened on January 6th. But what struck me in the book is when you talked about the word suicide, you said it is not a bad word. You don't blame yourself for not saying, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Because you did say that to Tommy many times. He was living times. with you at the time. Yeah, he was living with you. But what you didn't ask him was, are you having suicidal thoughts? And that, that scared me a little bit because you think, how can you ask someone that? Doesn't it plant a seed? Mm. And it's such an uncomfortable question to ask. Yeah. You say it needs to be asked very directly. Well, Tommy was adamant for the idea that there's no such thing as a bad word, oh. which is something he agreed with my, my dad about, his <laughs> grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so I, I take off on that idea and I say, Suicide's not a bad word. It's a bad idea. It's very difficult to utter that word. It's very difficult to reconcile ourselves to uh, what happened, but we need to talk about it. Just like I think in the political analogy here, in the rest of my book, we need to talk about fascism and what fascism is. It's also considered impolite to raise that word. Or but Jamie, why is it important to ask that question so directly? Well, um, You know, um, Tommy was a young man of extraordinary promise and passion. Uh, he wrote plays, he wrote poems, he was in his second year at Harvard Law School. Um, he had everything going for him, but he was um, afflicted by a disease yeah. called depression, which tens of millions of Americans suffer from. Um, and I don't, I can't say that I know that it would make any difference, but I was with Tommy on the last night, and I asked him how he was doing and what was going on with him and his girlfriend and everything. But I never said, uh, are, you, are you thinking about suicide? Are you having suicidal ideation? And, you know, I think that most parents probably don't do that because we don't want to plant the suggestion. You don't want that word hovering out there in midair yeah. like that. Uh, but I have you know, cross-examine myself about it. And I feel like not talking to someone who's depressed about suicide is like not talking to a teenager about sex. Mm -hmm. You know, and you might control. think you're yeah. suppressing something, yeah. Yeah. but it's going to be a reality regardless. So we got to talk about suicide, mm -hmm. just like we got to talk about violent authoritarianism so, in America. So let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about January 6th, because you, you laid Tommy yes. to rest on the 5th. You get a standing ovation from your colleagues uh, in Congress on the 6th, and then the events of that day unfold. We know them well by now. You're investigating what we don't know about January 6th. My daughter, Tabitha, was with me on January 6th, and our son-in-law, Mary, to our other daughter, Hank, he was there, too. Hiding under a desk. There were only a few kids there on yeah. that day because of COVID-19. 
most families weren't there, but, you know, I'd gotten special permission to bring them in because of the what was going Con on in our... Congressman, just in this short conversation, you've used the word uh, fascism and, and authoritarianism. That's where you believe the country may be going? Well, I think we saw a fantastic episode, an explosion of violent authoritarianism on January the 6th. We've got to tell the truth about that, and we have to have a reckoning with the reality of what happened. And the way I see it today is that there were three rings of activity, and one was a mass demonstration called by then-President Trump for a wild protest that became a riot. The second ring of activity, closer into the middle, was a violent insurrection called by groups like the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Proud Boys, the right. Aryan Nations, the militia groups, right. the QAnon networks. But the scariest ring was the very inner ring, the ring of the coup. And it's a strange word to use in American political parlance because we don't have a lot of experience with coups in American history. And we think of a coup as something against a president, but this was a coup waged by a president against a vice president and against the Congress in order to overthrow the 2020 presidential election and to seize the presidency for a second term. Before joining the committee, you were one of the most well-versed on what happened. Uh, is there any new information that you learned that surprised you? Oh, well, uh, what's going to happen this year with our hearings and with our report is we're going to lay out as best as we can uh, the complete story of everything that happened in all of these different rings of activity. And what are some of those details? Well, uh, the role that social media played in the propagandizing of the public and the spreading of lies, the role that violent insurrectionist groups played in this event and the coordination among them, and then how those activities were coordinated with the very inside of the action former, as President Trump tried to maintain his hold on so power. So let's talk about former President Trump, because he looms over all of this. There's a question of whether he'll run in 2024. Uh, Liz Cheney uh, said on Sunday that he was watching the riot on television. It was well televised uh, and did not immediately step in to cool things off. And he, that his daughter Ivanka came in twice, she says. She has firsthand knowledge and said, Dad, you have got to do something. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it all leads to the question, are you seeing evidence, I know you'll follow the facts, that could put the president in a criminally liable situation? Well, let's start with this. Is there anybody in this room or anybody in America who would not come forward and want to testify if people thought that you were involved in inciting and organizing a coup against the U.S. government? Everybody would come forward and say, I would have nothing to do with that. I would never do that. Let me tell you what happened. Instead, we have this 187-minute period that Congresswoman Cheney has talked about where Donald Trump's actions are a mystery. Mm. And the overwhelming number of people that we want to testify have come in and given us evidence. But the closer you get to Donald Trump, the more we're getting resistance from a handful of people like Mark Meadows, like Steve Bannon. You hopeful, but Jamie, about where this country's going? It's very frightening. Yes, we are the world's greatest multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural, constitutional democracy. That's who we are for real. And we're also divided. Yeah, but for we real. were not always that. Like the multis have been, we, we've made good on our founding promises yes. more lately than we did in the past. The and greatness that seems of to be America. Tied to trouble. Well, but look, the greatness of America is that we have always been willing to struggle to become Lincoln's ideal of government, of the people, by the people, for the people. We've been willing to go through that. That's what makes us great. Not that we were founded perfectly, because we weren't. Right. The values were right. magnificent and amazing that Jefferson put in the Declaration, but a lot of them were honored in the breach from the beginning. But right. we've struggled to become that democracy. We've got to keep struggling for it and not lapse into the kind of authoritarianism we see in Russia with Putin or Hungary with Orban or with the Chinese Communist Party, all of the people that Donald Trump loves. This is America. So this is the year we've got to take it all back and reclaim the country for the values of democracy that prior generations have fought for. Here's to 2022. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Congressman Raskin, uh, law professor by trade, yes. as we can yes. see. Uh, also, <laughs> yeah. also a, a unfortunately, <clears throat> full of wisdom on a difficult subject, the subject of grief. And I think people should pick this book up, not only for what you have to say about the trials of democracy, but for what you have to say coming out of your family tragedy. I do too, Tony. Yeah, I think it will help honesty. many. I, I think, think it will. help many. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And my son, Tommy, was a great lover of democracy yeah. and the law. And so I try to do honor to him in this book, which is a labor of love for him.
Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Raskin. The book is unthinkable, and it goes on sale tomorrow. If you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or text HELLO to 741-741. And don't be afraid to use the word in your own house, suicide.